Greetings again today in that name that's far above every name. Our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Good to see you today. We appreciate you being here. We welcome our visitors that's visiting with us today. May the good Lord bless you. And you that's listening out in the radio listening audience, we most certainly appreciate you tuning in to the Northside Baptist Church Hour that's coming to you live right from the auditorium of the Northside Baptist Church here in Athens, Georgia. Now this is Preacher Edward speaking. And you in the radio listen audience, if you get on that phone and call a friend, especially a shut-in, have them to tune in and get this hour, I do feel we can be an inspiration to them. You can get the message and the singing plus the music on cassette tape. It'll be tape number 353. I'm speaking today on the subject, What the Dying Thief Proved. What the Dying Thief Proved When He Died on the Cross. And I want you to turn in your Bible to Luke chapter 23 for the reading of God's Word. And remember, you can write in and get the tape by number, that is 353, or by title, What the Dying Thief Proved. If you send in a gift of $3 or more to help defray our radio expense. Now, the Sunday morning hour is a faith ministry. I've assumed the responsibility myself for paying this bill for the Sunday morning broadcast and there's a few in the radio listen audience can have a part in it if you'd like and it is a faith ministry that gives you a chance to have a part in it either you here in the church or out in the radio listen audience because it is a faith ministry and a home mission work and we have thousands out there listening on Sunday morning uh, many people call it the Sunday morning church worship hour because they not able to go to church because of age or providentially hindered and to look forward to it and you, you can be a real inspiration through this hour on Sunday morning by your praying and standing by this home mission work and so I want you to pray for me and write to me I do have five books on Bible questions and answers everyone should know and I mentioned Sunday and Sunday before last book number one book number two I have my in my hand here book number three. Let me give you a few of the questions on page one. Who in the Bible looked like a red hairy garment when he was born? What is the first question God ever asked man? How many songs did Solomon write? Who said the Lord filled him with wrinkles? Where in the Bible does it say a stone and a beam of timber will talk to each other? Where does it say the righteous shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked? When will it be that the moon will be as bright as the sun and the sun seven times brighter? Where do we find fingerprints um, implied in the Bible? What would be the name of the place where the Russian army will be buried in the future? How many persons do we have mentioned by name in the Bible? What woman made her son gloves and a neck collar out of goat hair? What woman had to shave her head before she could marry? Where does it say a ferry boat was used in the Bible? Where in the Bible does it say a wall fell upon 27,000 men? Where does it imply in the Bible that when a baby was born it was salted? Where in the Bible does it say soldiers wore blue? Who bought the first grave and what did it cost? What was the last miracle Jesus performed before he went to the cross? And finally... Where in the Bible does it say men were chose, uh, would, would choose to catch their wives as they came out to dance? Now, do you know the answer to these questions? That's page number one. You can get this book, book number three, by sending a gift of any amount and requesting the book. Now, my mailing address is Virgil Edwards, P.O. Box 501, Athens, Georgia. 30603 is the zip code number. While you're turning to Luke chapter 23, let me remind you of the meeting next week in case somebody tuned in late. Remember the Independent Baptist Fellowship of the State of Georgia, which was organized here at Northside in 1962. We'll be meeting here tomorrow afternoon, convening at 2 o'clock. Pastor Ed Cook of Atlanta will be the first speaker. At 3 o'clock, one of America's great evangelists, John Mitchell, will be speaking. At 4 o'clock, uh, Brother Harold Venable, pastor of, the, of uh, New Heights Baptist Church in Reesville, North Carolina, will be the speaker. 
Then at 7.30, Dr. Harold Seitler, pastor of the Tabernacle Baptist Church in Greenville, will be the speaker. And we're looking forward to a great fellowship. And then on Tuesday night, Brother Hal Venable will be back speaking for us on Tuesday night and again on Wednesday night. And I want you to take the advantage of these speakers and hear them. They'll do you good. Tell your friends and neighbors about it. We're looking forward to a good fellowship and a good meeting. And just a word about our brochure on our proposed Holy Land tour. We have the brochures available, and we're planning this tour for March of next year, and that'll be here before you realize. First thing you know, it'll be Thanksgiving, then Christmas, then time for the tour. And you need to get your name on the list. We'll never have another uh, this good price-wise. And take the advantage of it. Write in and get a brochure or call in. Come by and get it. Take a look at it. If you're interested in making this tour a real tour of a lifetime, going to Jordan and Israel, going to Petra, Masada, places that you'd really appreciate seeing. And get in touch with me about the tour if you're interested. Maybe some of you in the radio listening audience, your pastor's never been. One of the greatest things you can do for him is send him. Send him and his wife, send a friend, uh, send your children, anything uh, you can do to get people over there. It'll be a blessing to them. I know by experience, I've seen it happen many, many times. And this will be trip number 15 for me. I'll be working with Dr. Waters out of Lawrence, South Carolina. And he has one of his members here today. Tracy, we're glad to see you and the little one. She went with us on a trip two years ago. Met a fine young man from Dr. Waters' church. He fell in love, got married, and now they have a wonderful son here. And so you can't tell to go on these Holy Land tours. And so we glad she's here and our mother and the little one. And so it's a real, real trip of a lifetime. Dr. Waters has been over there. This will be his 23rd trip. It'll be my 15th trip, his 23rd trip. So I think we're qualified to kind of direct you around. And so we'll help you. Now, I mentioned uh, uh, Trace and the little one talking about the Holy Land trip, and he cried out. He didn't like that too much, you don't guess. Well, bless his heart, he will. All right, Luke chapter 23 for the reading of God's Word. And let's see what the Bible has to say about a thief that died on a cross. Verse 39, page 1110 in the original Schofield Reference Bible. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said uh, unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. It was about the sixth hour. There was darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour. And the sun was darkened, and the veil of the temple was written in the mist. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. Now I'm speaking on the subject that I announced earlier on what the dying thief proved. Now you have here on these three crosses, the Son of God on the middle cross, two thieves, one on either side, and one of them proves something that I want to emphasize today. Now we have seven false doctrines are denied by this incident. This incident here of the thief dying on the cross, you have seven false doctrines denied by what happened to him on the cross. I'll mention these. Number one, it denies that baptism is essential to salvation. See, here is a man here that died on a cross. He went to paradise. He was never baptized. He had not a chance to be baptized. Now, you have a cult in the land today that tells you you have to be baptized in water in order to be saved. That is not true. That's denying the Word of God. You do not have to be baptized in water to be saved. You saved by repenting of your sins and faith in Jesus Christ. A lot of our young men died on the battlefront, had accepted the Lord, never had a chance to be baptized. A lot of people in hospital rooms got saved on their deathbeds, never had a chance to be baptized. 
And there'll be a lot of people in heaven that's never been baptized by water. And there'll be a lot of people in hell that's been baptized more than one time. Even Christians are baptized a sprinkle. And they'll be in hell because they failed to get saved. Now water baptism is not intrinsic to salvation. You need to realize that. Because there's not enough water in the seven seas to wash away one sin. You say by the blood of Jesus Christ, faith in Him. So it denies that baptism is essential to salvation. The second thing it denies is that the observance of the Lord's Supper is essential to salvation. You have people today that say you must take the Lord's Supper in order to be saved. They say you're actually eating the body of Christ and drinking His blood. Not a word of that true. There's a lot of people today that's never observed the Lord's Supper and they're saved and they'll be in heaven. And so we know then that this thief dying on the cross never had a chance to observe the Lord's Supper. Never had a chance to drink the, the wine. And therefore he went on to paradise. So that denies uh, that false doctrine that you have to observe the Lord's Supper in order to be saved. That is not true. The third one is it denies that church membership is essential to salvation. Now here you have a man, a thief, a man deserved to die on a cross. They are getting saved and going to, to paradise and he never, never had a chance to join the church. Now I believe in joining a church. I believe that God established the true Bible believing church. I believe that. And I believe when every per when a person gets saved, they should find a local assembly of people, a church like Northside or some other church uh, similar to Northside, where the Bible is preached, where the man of God preaches the Bible, where people believe the truth, and you ought to join that church and stand by it and, and find your position in that church and begin to serve God. Now, Jesus believed in the church. He said, upon this rock, I'll build my church. The gates of hell not prevail against it. And you have the local church mentioned many times in the Bible. And I thank God for the real, true, Bible-believing local churches. I know you have many churches today. Postatized have left the faith. They do no more than play religion on Sunday morning. And many go to church for respectability. They hear nothing and feel nothing and go home empty and uh, without hearing anything according to the Bible. You have many, many churches like that today, but you still have many churches where they believe the Bible, where they carry their Bible to church. I thank God for the independent Baptist churches. In the independent Baptist churches, you watch the people coming in and you see that most of them have their Bibles. I like that. You ought to always carry that Bible to church. I went to a church sometime to attend a revival because uh, one of our members wanted me to go to for a friend's sake. And I went to this church. I won't name the nomination. But I went in there and uh, wasn't a Baptist by any means, not even a Southern Baptist. And I didn't see the first Bible brought to that church. And when the liberal preacher got up to preach, he took a book, looked like a song book. And out of that, he gave his little lecture. Anybody get saved? No. Nobody can get saved apart from the Word of God. Now, beloved, listen. You need to go to a church where the, the Bible is preached and people believe the Bible. Don't ever be ashamed of that Bible. Carry your Bible with you to the house of God. But church membership is not essential to salvation. There'll be multitudes in heaven that never had a chance to join the local assembly. There'll be multitudes in hell that's had the name on church roll for years that failed to get right with God. I believe in church membership. I think you ought to join the local church. I think you should have followed the Lord in baptism. I think you should observe the Lord's Supper when they serve it. But that's not essential to salvation. Salvation doesn't come through church membership. No religion in the world can get you to heaven. I don't care how strong it may be. Only repentance of your sins and faith in Jesus Christ will ever get you to heaven. Number four, it denies that restitution is necessary to salvation. Now, I've talked to a lot of unsaved people that put up this argument. They say, preach Edwards. I've done some things wrong. I need to straighten some things out. I need to go and, and do some restitution before I get saved. Now, you shouldn't do that. You need to do like the old song says, Just as I am without one plea, 
Uh, Lord, I come to thee. And that's the way to come to God. Not You don't have to go out and do anything, correct anything in order to get saved. Now, if God moves upon your heart to do restitution, then you could do that after you're saved. I know a lot of people's done that. I've known people that get saved, go back and pay up the old debts. I owed about $4 when I got saved and I dodged a grossman around for a while because I wasn't making much money back those days. I took the whole amount of $4 and bought a week's supply of groceries and I was behind with my grocery bill. Now I can hand my wife about $75 and say, try to bring me some back if you can. And evidently she can't because she never mentions bringing any back. And so I don't know whether she uh, uh, keeps the dollar to or not. If she does, I'll forgive her for that because uh, uh, she has to go in and fight the traffic and wait in the waiting line to pay the grocery bill and spend all of that time. So if there's any left out of what I give her, that's all right. And uh, then if uh, she needs a little more, she'll tell me that time she gets in. She'll say, well, you didn't give me but $60 today in the grocery bill, $65. Back in those days, it was $4. And I went to the grocery store myself most of the time in those days. And I owed this man $4. And when I got saved, you know what I did? I got those $4. I went down. I paid him. I apologized. You know what he said? He said, I wish a few more church members would get right with God so they'd pay me what they owe me. Well, now these men out here in business, they'll watch that church member. That man that calls himself a Christian, if he won't pay his yes and honest debts, well, he can never win that man to God. They don't have any confidence in him. A man that won't pay his yes and honest debts might as well stop trying to win souls, especially those that knows he won't pay these bills. Why, well, brother, he's a stumbling block. He can't be a soul winner. Now, you might want to do restitution. That is, you might want to go straighten out something. You might want to go talk to your neighbor and apologize for the fuss you had. You might want to do something after you're saved, but you don't have to do that to get saved. Now, this poor dying thief, he might owe debts. He might have had a fuss or two. He had done a lot of wrong. He had been sentenced to die, but he didn't say, Now, uh, let me get out off the cross, go straighten up all of this mess I've made and indulged in, and then come in. No, no. He just like he was hanging on the cross. He couldn't do restitution. He couldn't get out. He couldn't go back and straighten out and correct anything he'd done wrong. But he got saved. Now if you want to straighten out something that you've done wrong, you do that after you get saved. And then he denies, he denies this also. Number five, it denies the doctrine of purgatory or soul sleeping. Now you have a false religion in the land today and you have a cult in the land today. Now, beloved, this man died on the cross, denies purgatory. Now, there's no such thing in the Bible as purgatory. You may say, preacher, what is that? That means that, that you uh, go down and get your sins purged after you die. No, no. If you don't get your sins straightened out before you die, you're going to hell. And there's no such thing as purgatory. That's a lie of the devil. And you don't need to believe the lies of the devil. Then you have a cult in the land today that teach soul sleeping. They'll tell you whenever uh, that you uh, die, your soul goes to sleep and you don't know anything of the resurrection. Now this man here, he, he didn't uh, have any soul sleeping attacked on him. Jesus said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't say, now in the resurrection, you'll be with me in paradise. He said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. So this thief dying on the cross denies uh, the theory of purgatory and denies uh, the, the cult that teaches soul sleeping. Now you must remember that. Now this man... Uh, he couldn't have gone to um, gone down into paradise without having something purged for him. Any such thing as purgatory. God pardoned him from his sins right there on the cross, like He does you the very moment you get saved. Now there's no such thing as soul sleeping in this man because he went straight to paradise that same day, and later went up into the third heaven, and so uh, he his soul didn't sleep, and yours won't either. Now these poor old people trot around here with the poison literature and teach soul sleeping. They don't know what it's all about. They don't believe in Jesus Christ as God. Many of them, they're all messed up and they'll find out in a matter of a few seconds after they die that the soul don't sleep. 
Now your soul never sleeps, only the body sleeps. Then there's something else that this thing, this man uh, denied on the cross, his death on the cross denied, and that is, it denies that works are essential to salvation. Now here's a man that thought that if he had, if he had to work for salvation, he'd have been in trouble. Why, he couldn't move his hands. He couldn't move his feet. And yet you have people today that are trying to work for salvation. I've talked to people. They said, well, I'll tell you, I'm not so bad. I do this and I do other things. And, and uh, I've tried to be good to my neighbor and I've tried to help where the cause is. Now, what are they doing? They're trying to depend or rely upon what they've done or their good works or their good deeds to get them to heaven. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 2, not of works, lest any man should boast. By grace through faith are you saved, and not, not of works, lest any man should boast. Now there's plenty of work to be done, but that's to be done after you're saved. While well, you can work yourself until uh, you pass out and die and go to hell, a work's not going to save anybody. But work is wonderful after you get saved because that adds to your reward. God keeps the record of what you do for Him. Anybody that's depending upon what they do and what they don't do and, and how good they've been and, and how much they've sacrificed to get them to heaven will miss it. And anytime somebody begins to tell you, well, I'm not so bad after all and I've done this and I've tried to help my neighbor, they're counting on good works and good deeds. To get them to heaven, they'll miss heaven if they die without accepting Christ. Now some people say, well, I'll tell you, preacher, uh, you just don't know whether you're saved or not till you die. And then uh, God's going to check on your life. And if you've lived good enough, you go to heaven. If you haven't, you go to hell. Now that's not true either. That's a lie of Satan. Now you're not saved on good deeds, good works, human efforts. Now you're saved by grace through faith in Christ. And so that denies a works essential for salvation. This man couldn't do a thing. He's nailed to that cross. What kind of works could he do? None. And then number seven, he denies that salvation obtained by keeping the law of Moses. Now some people say, well, if I keep the law, if I keep the golden rule, if I abide by the golden rule, if I keep the Ten Commandments, then I go to heaven. No, no, no man's ever kept the Ten Commandments going to heaven by Jesus. is the only one ever really kept them in the first place. Now, Jesus kept the Ten Commandments and fulfilled them literally and minutely for us. Whenever he died on the cross, he, he kept all the Ten Commandments. And whenever you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you accept the Ten Commandments already having been kept by him. And that's in part unto you as having kept them in Christ. He kept them for you. Now, if man could have been saved by keeping the law of Moses or any of the commandments, there had been no need of Jesus coming and dying. You have a cult in the land today that's trying to get to heaven by keeping the law. They say you have to uh, abide on uh, Saturdays the Sabbath, and the, you have to keep the Sabbath on Saturday, and, and a lot of other works they try to add to what they call salvation, and they know nothing about salvation. Now, you're not saved by keeping the law. And you can keep the Ten Commandments and die and go straight to hell as a Martin to his God. And you don't, you're not saved in keeping any kind of rule or regulation, the golden rule of law or what not. And this man on the cross couldn't keep the law. They was up there, had broken all of them and kept none of them. And then God had to save him. Now there's a few things here that this man affirms on the cross. Seven doctrines are affirmed by this incident. I mentioned seven false doctrines exposed by it. There's seven doctrines affirmed by it. I move through them early in the next ten minutes, the Lord willing. Seven doctrines affirmed by this incident. This man died on the cross. Number one, it affirms that there is a heaven. It affirms that there is a heaven. Verse 43, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Now at that particular time, paradise was down in the heart of the earth in Abraham's bosom. And when Jesus died on the cross and went down the heart of the earth, then of course he, he transferred paradise out to the third heaven. And paradise today is in the third heaven and not down in the heart of the earth. And it proves that there is a heaven, that there's a paradise. Now we can't deny that. 
It's proven this man died on the cross, proved there was a, a, a heaven or a paradise. Today shall thou be with me in paradise. Secondly, it affirms the necessity of repentance. Now, a lot of people say, well, we don't need to do and repent today. All you need to do is just believe, and all you need to repent too. Repentance and believism go hand in hand. It's like a glove on your hand. You need, you need to repent. Now, repentance simply means that you've changed your mind about sin. You've changed your mind about your past life. You've changed your mind about living for the devil and you want to be saved. And you, you've changed your mind. That's repentance. You're sorry about your past life. And you repent in your heart and soul that you won't accept Christ and you believe on Jesus. Any person that walks down the aisle to be saved, he's, he's repenting. He, he's sorry of his sins. He wants to get rid of them. And if he's not sorry about his past life, wants to continue on in that past life, no need of him coming to the altar. He needs to repent, sorry for his sins, and ready to believe on Jesus. So it affirms the necessity of repentance. Now this little easy believism today has filled up a lot of churches and the people hung around for a while and quit the church and die and go to hell. Now I don't believe in a little easy believism today. I believe in sinners getting unto a conviction of their sins and the Spirit of God moving up on them and, and then the Holy Spirit working on them and, and them repenting and believing on Jesus. This little idea of signing a card and shaking the preacher's hand is not enough. You don't go to heaven that way. Now you can sign a card and, and shake the preacher's hand, but that won't save you. Now you must remember that. It, it affirms the necessity of repentance. He said, remember me. Number three, it affirms the necessity of simple trusting in Christ. In verse 42, what did he say in verse 42? He said, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. He wasn't trusting in Caesar. He wasn't trusting in Pilate. He wasn't trusting in the apostles. He wasn't trusting in the other thief on the other side. He said, Lord, remember me. Lord, remember me. He was trusting in Jesus. Simple, childlike faith in Jesus Christ. Of course he had repented. He was sorry he was a lost sinner. And he trusted in Jesus and God saved him. Number four, it affirms that conversion is immediate and not gradual. Look at verse 43. Today thou shalt be with me. Today with me, Jesus said. Today, right now, today you're going to be with me in paradise. Now it didn't take God all day to save that man. The very moment he repented, the very moment he believed in Jesus, right then God saved him. Now you don't have to crawl on your knees or walk a mile or do a restitution as I said earlier in order to be saved. God will save you in a moment in the twinkling of your eye if you mean business. There's a lot of people that's gotten saved. God got a hold of their heart, shook them up. They wanted a conviction. And they got up and come down and told the preacher they wanted to get saved. Many of them were saved the moment they got up out of that seat. They repented. They knew what they wanted. They believed. And they only came down and they, they work, the person worked, the preacher worked with them and prayed with them. But many of them got saved before they got down there. Then there's others that came on down to the altar and you had to show them plainly what to do and, and work with them in order to get them saved. And so God saves a person in, in just a matter of moments. You don't have to go out here and beg God to save you for days at a time, hours at a time. I've seen people get on the altar and, and almost stay there alive by trying to get God to save you. You don't have to beg God to save you. They've been misinformed. They get down there and... And uh, then somebody will come down who doesn't know how to deal with people. And somebody on one side will say, hold on, brother. And somebody on the other side will say, turn a loose, brother. Well, now how in the world would that poor sinner know what to do? Uh, beloved, sinners need the simple fact of salvation. That Jesus died for his sins. That he's a sinner. And if you repent and believe, you'll be saved. And you don't have to stay on the morning's beach for an hour. And uh, a lot of people come down and they on the morning's beach for an hour or so trying to beg God to save them. Now, there's a lot of people come down that didn't understand. And they want to be sure they knew what they were doing. And they want to be sure they understood what they were doing. And it took some time to deal with them. 
I've seen them like that. That's all right. That's wonderful. That's, that's uh, the thing they need to do if you don't fully understand what they're doing. They want to be sure they know what they're doing. But you don't have to beg God and beg God. God's far more concerned and far more anxious to save you than you ought to be saved. And he said, him that comes to me, I would in no wise cast out. And so you don't have to beg and plead for God to save you if you really want to be saved. And so salvation conversion is, of course, is, um, is trust in Jesus Christ. And it's not a, a gradual working of uh, trying to get saved over a period of time. You can be saved a moment of time. Number five, it affirms that a sinner may be saved in his dying hour without any overt action on his part. A sinner can be saved in his dying moments. Now, you don't have many people that are saved on their deathbed, but you do have some. I've led a few to God. I believe were genuinely saved on their deathbed, some old loved ones. And I, I believe they were really saved. There have been boys on the battlefront actually saved just before they got killed. There have been people in the hospitals actually saved before they died. But many of them are not saved. Many of them get skid up and, and they think they're going to die. And they uh, think I better make a profession. And then they get well, go home, and never you never see any sign of them being saved. Better die than go on to hell. Like a man that fell out with his neighbor and, and said he thought he was going to die. And they hadn't spoken to each other for years and years. Thought he was going to die and said to his neighbor, uh, I want you to come over and, and talk with me. I mean, I need to straighten out something. The neighbor came over and he said, Now listen, neighbor, we have been fussing and cussing one another and angry at each other for years, haven't spoken for a long time, and I'm about to die. I'm going to leave this world, and I, I don't want to leave this world and be not able to speak to you, you speak to me, and I want to get it straightened out. But he said, Now listen. Said, in case I don't die and get well, we'll continue on as usual. Well, now that's, uh, that's not a way to do, do, do the business. If man had meant business, he wouldn't have said, just in case I get well, we'll go on and refuse to speak to each other. No, 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 no. It doesn't work that way. And so the, it affirms a sinner may be saved in his dying hour without any overt act whatsoever on his part. And so... Uh, God will save you even in your dying moments. If you don't take a chance to wait till then, you might not. You might miss it. Uh, eternity is, uh, is too important. Your soul is too important. Then number six, it affirms that a thief can be saved. And that shows you there that no matter how deep a man's gone in sin, if he means business, he can be saved. He can be saved if he means business. I don't care. He may be a cusser, drunk, a murder, rapist, whoremonger, harlot. I don't care what he is. If he means business, he can be saved. The apostle Paul, one of the meanest rascals, ever walked in shoe leather. And God struck him down the master road and saved him. He became the greatest preacher ever lived. And so it doesn't matter uh, about your past sins, what you've done or what you haven't done. It's what you do about you and uh, your relationship between you and the Lord the moment you want to be saved. God will blot out all that past life and those past sins. He just blot them out and never bring them against you anymore. Number seven, it affirms the doctrine of assurance. I believe in assurance. I believe in a security of the believer. In verse 43, he said, Today shall thou be with me in paradise. That's the doctrine of assurance affirmed. Today shall thou be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't say, Now, if you'll hold out now until you draw your last breath, you might make it through. No, no. When God saved him, God said, Today you're going to be with me in paradise. And when Jesus saves you, he says to you, to, to Someday you're going to be with me in heaven. He didn't say, If you hold out faithful, he didn't say if you uh, quit cussing out loud and drinking beer, of course you quit doing that when you get saved. But he didn't say that. He said, uh, today shall thou be with me in paradise. This very day thou shall be with me in paradise. He didn't say hope so, maybe so, thanks so, probably so. He said, today shall thou be with me in paradise. Now when you get saved, God can say to you, someday you're going to be with me in heaven. He didn't say if you did this or didn't do that. He said, someday you're going to be with me in heaven. And you have that assurance when you get saved that someday you're going to be with me in heaven. And God's word cannot be denied 
And that's what God said. And that's what I believe. And that's the Bible. That's what God teaches, regardless of what you've been taught or what you think about it. That's the preaching and teaching of the Word of God. Thank you. You've listened well. Stand to your feet. Father in heaven, today I've delivered the message you laid on my heart. There are those out there in the radio listening audience need God. Maybe somebody here in this building needs God. Now I pray, Father, you'll use this message to stir hearts, prick the hearts and souls of people. Get glory to yourself. Honor your word. We know you will, dear Father. Honor your word, I pray today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Debbie Player stands there. So now you listen to me. If you're in this building and you're unsaved, you want to get saved, you come down here. We'll help you to God. If you're in this building, you once knew God, you backslid on the Lord, you want to get back into fellowship, you come down here. We'll help you back into fellowship. If you're in this building and you're looking for old-fashioned, fundamental, Bible-believing Baptist church, and this, and you've chosen Northside in your heart and mind, you want to come down, present yourself for, as, as for membership, you may feel free to come forward. Or for any other reason, I haven't mentioned, you feel you ought to come, then you move forward while she plays for us. How about it? Anyone? We'll help you. We want to help you. It's up to you and what you do about it. I'll preach the word. Now it's up to you to do what God lays on your heart to do. How about it? If God is speaking, will you obey the Lord? 